Today's episode is brought to you by We Break You Buy. Interested in sports cards and memorabilia? Check out We Break You Buy on TikTok. We Break You Buy is a small operation run by three brothers, offering spots for a chance at winning some incredible sports cards and memorabilia. That's We Break You Buy. Check it out today on TikTok. <laughs> Patrick Darms. And I am your co-host, Anton Paras. We're joined today by an esteemed guest, producer Eric Taylor. Welcome back. Welcome back, yeah. Eric. Thank you, boys. I am elated to be here, uh, as always. So stoked to talk about movies with y'all. Well, we are so happy to have you. And this is not just any episode. This is, of course, the first episode that listeners will be hearing in the year of our Lord 2024. But this is also our 50th episode. 50. 50. The big 5 0. Wow. We made it. I'm both That's proud a- and honored to be here for your 50th episode and proud of you guys for really doing it. You guys are doing really great work. Uh, I, everyone I show you guys to loves the content. So good on you. Keep it up. <laughs> well, Eric, we appreciate the support and we love having you on. I can't think of a better film than the one that we're going to be talking about today to celebrate. 50 episodes of why wasn't it better that's one way of putting it (laughs) i don't know exactly why we chose this film as our 50th episode movie but we did and uh well we're gonna have to talk about it one way or another but i think we all are looking forward to discussing this this film even though i think it's safe to say none of us really enjoyed watching it well well pat let's you know when we really think about the essence of our podcast and what we want to look at and analyze this film really hits all the check boxes right so maybe it is it it is quite fitting yes that is true It, it, it absolutely meets the criteria of why wasn't it better we haven't even mentioned what it is yet and i i just realized this in the last episode never say never again we didn't really give any kind of a hint as to what we were covering now we did include the film's title in the list of films that we were going to cover this season uh, when we did our uh, season three preview but uh, this is our first and only animated film that we will be covering this season it is of course the lord of the rings we are talking about the 1978 version of the lord of the rings directed by ralph bakshi and when i mentioned potential episodes that eric would want to be on i kind of forced his hand a little bit because i knew we wanted him on for the 50th episode because he was our first guest and you know i think it's a good idea to have him on for any anniversary episode that we have so i kind of forced his hand by having him watch this film uh, to prepare for it. The kicker, it is not available for free streaming on any service. So I don't know if any of y'all found it, but I had to pay extra for this. (laughs) You rented it? I had to. I couldn't find it anywhere else. (laughs) So I had to rent it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was fortunate right. enough to have a digital copy of this from from back in the day. Wow. Uh, I'm very glad that I didn't have to rent it because paying any kind of extra money for this film was just unfathomable to me. And I'm sorry you did so, Eric. I, um, I told I told yeah. Anton I'm, I'm writing it off as a promotional expense. There is no way <laughs> that this movie is going to get any unmitigated amount of money from me. What I mean, <laughs> here, and here I am. I bought the remastered deluxe uh, DVD that has the Rankin, uh, the Rankin Bass Hobbit and Return of the King plus the the Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings. So is that is that a real thing? Yeah, it's actually a real thing, but. It, Look, I, I did not buy it. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Um. I, at this point, I don't think we are concealing our opinions of this, but this is going to be a lot of fun to talk about. And it is a shame that it isn't available for free streaming right now, because up until very recently, it was. This was on 
the now defunct HBO Max, which is now just very stupidly called Max. And due to that stupid Discovery Warner merger that we've talked about before on this podcast, it is no longer available there or anywhere. So you have to pay for it, as Eric so bravely did. And that is his commitment to this podcast as a guest. I love you guys that much. Well, that I paid we have four dollars <laughs> to watch this movie, <laughs> and that was and we that was too it. much. You t- oh. We love you too, Eric. We love you too. Oh, oh before Eric. we get into it, I do have a couple of film updates for you, Anton. That's some admin. Um, I I caught a bit of this new Zach Phil, uh, Zach Snyder film, Rebel Moon, yesterday. Someone in who's visiting for the holidays was watching it. Um, let me just say that I will not be watching the rest of it anytime soon. It was uh, not very good. And um, I did see uh, recently that new Netflix film, Leave the World Behind. I really enjoyed it. So with Rebel Moon, we we talked about this with a friend of the show, frequent guest Tyler, that there was a lot of elements from Star Wars that didn't end up getting used. Do you feel like that was accurate with Rebel Moon? I didn't see enough of it to, to okay. give you an answer on that. I, I, I'm, it was, I saw about, I would say, 10 minutes of it. And it was, um, it was truly awful. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have I to wanna... say, I'm not, not a, not a Zack Snyder fan. Well, don't want to make you have to revisit your experience watching it because it sounds pretty terrible. But I, I will, I'll say, I didn't feel compelled to watch it. I was compelled enough to leave the room after ten minutes. So let me just say that. Leave the world behind. Pretty good. I, I enjoyed that one. If any of the listeners, if you would like us to cover that or any other film, please write in and let us know. Just a reminder that we do entertain listener requests. We've done one in the past when we covered uh, Ocean's 12. Um, we actually have one coming up next week that was not in our original lineup for season three. I won't reveal what it is yet, but next week's episode, at least as long as we get the guest and we get the recording done in the appropriate amount of time, next week's episode will be a listener request and it is a film from 2023. That's all I will say for now. Yeah, always a good time to have a surprise episode. And and like you said, Pat, we've been getting lots and lots of listener engagement all across our platforms, which is fantastic to see. Yeah, it's wonderful. The YouTube growth continues to really wow us. And and Um, not just the the feedback we get there is just it's tremendous. Yeah, and not just the YouTube, but also on our Instagram. Love seeing all the engagement and comments. Um, we've been putting more and more of our reels up there. So just wanted to give you listeners, thank you so much for all your engagement. And please just keep it coming. Let us know what you think. And we're here to you know, respond and take any criticism you have and even talk about films that we haven't even thought about yet. So please keep it coming. Definitely. Always open to suggestions. Eric, is there anything you want to plug? The last time you were here, you did a little bit of promotion. If you'd like to continue to do so, now's the time. For sure, yeah. I mean, I'm still obviously making music. I have a um, a four-song EP coming out next year, early next year. Um, you can find all of my music and any information at Might Be Thunder. Uh, that's might be thunder all one word on YouTube, Instagram, everything like that. I'm, I'm still doing, uh, the circling signals, which is that weird sort of analog horror series. I've through the holidays, I haven't really been working on anything, but, uh, there's much more of that coming up again at might be thunder at either Instagram or YouTube. Um, or if you look up might be thunder on Spotify, I'm on there as well. Um, yeah, I guess with that being said, Anton, we can get into discussing the animated version of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, this film by Ralph Bakshi presents the first half of J.R.R. Tolkien's renowned fantasy tale. Old wise wizard Gandalf entrusts the young hobbit Frodo with a magical ring. Soon dark forces are after Frodo, so he must leave his peaceful home and travel to the ominous Mount Doom, where the ring must be destroyed. Accompanied by a trio of hobbit friends, as well as other companions, Frodo is aided by the mysterious Aragorn and other heroic allies. I just have to say I found this description uh, on the first page of Google, and it's not a very good description, but we're going to keep it in anyway. The Lord of the Rings was released on November 15th, 1978, by Fantasy Films, Sal Zance Film Productions, and United Artists. It was directed by Ralph Bakshi, 
The screenplay was written by Chris Conklin and Peter S. Beagle, based on the novels by J.R.R. Tolkien, voiced by Christopher Gard, William Squire, Michael Scholes, John Hurt, Simon Chandler, Michael Graham Cox, Anthony Daniels, and David Buck. The budget, $4 million, that is $19 million adjusted for inflation, and a box office of $32.6 million, that is $153 million adjusted for inflation. Anton, why was this film chosen? Let's think about all the different franchises that we've had the opportunity to talk about on the podcast. We always say popular franchises, there's always a lot of hype. Is it fair to say that J.R.R. Tolkien's works are some of the most popular, one of the most popular franchises of all time? Absolutely. Very fair. For sure. Are we, you know, posing both to, you know, you, Pat and Eric, are you fans of Tolkien? I very much am. Uh, I read The Hobbit in fifth grade. It was required reading, and it immediately captured my uh, imagination in a way that really nothing had ever before. This would have been 1998 when I read this for the first time. For me, it, it, it tapped into something that's you know that Star Wars or Batman could not, because at that point I hadn't seen this animated film yet. The Peter Jackson trilogy hadn't come out yet so all i had to do was imagine everything in my head and i hadn't even seen the absolutely terrible rankin bass tv movie yet at that point so it was it was really just me reading the book becoming an, an, an enchanted by it and then i i read the lord of the rings uh, shortly thereafter and i remember my dad telling me about it he's like you know there is actually a movie of this if you're interested. And I was like, really? I, I've never heard of it. And by that point, I was already a you know pretty serious movie buff. And he's like, yeah, it's an animated film. I was like, is it any good? He was like, well, we can rent it, which is not really an answer. And, you know, probably a wise decision on his part. He didn't want to spoil anything for me. But I have to say, I still think Lord of the Rings is my favorite work of fiction that I have ever read, even to this date. What about you, Eric? So, yeah, I mean, I it was similar to uh, Jurassic Park. Back when I was a kid, my dad would read me all of these books that were way beyond my reading uh, ability, you know, when I was a, a, a small kid. And um, similar to you, Patrick, it's just, it's such a well-built world. And when you think that, you know, Tolkien really did sort of make this whole thing as sort of a bedtime story for his kids. That just makes it really cool. And it's so well written. Um, I went back and tried uh, reading it again recently. And while I love it, I don't really have time to read an entire chapter describing like the face of a hill, you know, he is it's a dense. very, he's a, yeah. And I love dense books. Don't get me wrong. I just ain't got time now, but, um, yeah, and obviously the trilogies and stuff like that. I haven't read the Samarillion. I I don't know a lot about the deep lore. I I didn't watch the new series on oh, on Amazon Prime. Um, so you know I, I'm not like a hyper fan, but I do love it. And if you're not watching the extended trilogy over a weekend, like once a year, you're doing it wrong. You know what I mean? It, it is one of those experiences that you just you just got to get through. Uh, you got to make some time to do it. At least me every year. And I'm you know, again, I'm not I'm not a huge nerd about it. But yeah, it's it's great. And it's always worth a watch. The uh, the new series. This this isn't this is not worth a, a watch. But <laughs> Eric showing his hand. Uh, and here's the funny thing and i'm sitting here and i'm like i'm usually the guy that's either trying to defend a movie or being the devil's advocate that's why i was so excited about this because i'm i'm just real excited to share my thoughts with you guys and the listeners <laughs> uh, that's wonderful anton <laughs> tolkien fan oh uh, i mean and my ex um it's fair to say i am a pretty big tolkien nerd and very similarly read the books at a very young age and I was introduced to these films with, I referenced this before, we had a huge VHS library at, um, at our local library. And so I was able to watch the 1978 Lord of the Rings, the Rankin-Bass Hobbit, 
and they haunted me for the rest of my childhood. <laughs> so I remember Understandable. I remember when you know, Pat and I were talking about this film and you know the episode coming up to talk about this film. I was like, well, I have to revisit that again. And it's so funny just because there is definitely a place in history for not only the 1978 Lord of the Rings, but also for the Rankin Bass Hobbit. And I mentioned it, but you know, in, in popular culture today, there was even a 2023 or 2022 animated series, Smiling Friends, that have an episode where during the duration of the episode, there was a character that was stylized exactly like Bilbo from the Hobbit uh, animated film. Hmm. So there is definitely, I will say, there is a place in history for these films. We'll talk a little bit more about where that place is, at least for Lord of the Rings uh, from 1978. But I am I'm a huge fan of this franchise and totally agree um, with you there, Eric have to make sure that we're doing that yearly extended version watch only extended you don't do the you don't do the shorter versions that's oh, no. that's unacceptable oh i actually i think i have a controversial take i prefer the theatrical versions okay no hey here, and here's the thing as long as you experience them that's fine you know i, I disagree just because i i just like watching the extended cut. I, you have to understand too. The way I watch the movies is like I turn them on in the morning and they just play all the way throughout the day. You know, I don't sit yeah. there and you know watch it the entire time. I'll do other stuff, but um, but I feel that. Yeah, you know? I like them very much. I just <laughs> think, especially with Return of the King, which is I think that's long enough theatrically. For sure. Yeah. But I still, uh, I, I still adore them. Peter I'm Jackson's always, it's, it's it's a triumph. It's a masterpiece. The whole trilogy. It's the best trilogy ever made. It absolutely, really is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll tell you the reason that I always will, if an extended cut is around, I'll at least try to watch it is because sometimes, you know, sometimes it makes the movie make more sense. I don't know if that's the case in Lord of the Rings necessarily, but you know, um, that's why I would say probably. I would do the extended versions just to see everything, you know? Eric, like you, I have not read The Silmarillion. I've tried before, and I, it, it's, it's, it's just not an easy read. It, it's not. Have you, Anton? I've attempted, and yeah, very it, it, it's a very dense piece of work. It was published after Tolkien's death, too, by his son. So you have to wonder, like, would that really have even been something that he would have published all of that himself? We'll never know. Maybe he did. I don't know the uh, details on the publication of it. You know, it, it, admittedly, Eric, I know you said you haven't seen it. Uh, Anton, have you seen the Amazon series Rings of Power? I ended up briefly watching like the first and second episode, and wasn't for me. I know that there are a lot of folks that really enjoyed revisiting the series. There's definitely very high production values, but it just wasn't for me. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, I did watch the entire thing so far. I was obviously, you know, it, it, there's only been one season. Uh, I was definitely impressed with the production values on it. I thought it was fine. I just don't know where they're going to go with the story because it, it's sort of based on the Silmarillion, but not really because they don't technically have the rights to it. it they've taken stuff from it. It's, it's very odd. I don't really know where they're going to go with it, but I'll, I'll keep watching it whenever the next season comes around, maybe. Yeah, you're in it for the long haul? Eh, yeah, we'll see. I'm not really doing a great job of selling it, but that's not my job. So, uh, and believe it or not, Anton, we mentioned this on another episode. There is an animated Lord of the Rings film called The War of the Rohirrim coming out in December of 2024. I have no idea what to expect. It has uh, the voices of some well-known actors like Brian Cox. I wouldn't say I'm excited for it, but I'm I'm kind of curious. Personally, I'm very excited. I th I always like to imagine more and more series opting for an animated film. Like, for example, I'm a big fan of the Game of Thrones series up to a point. But if they even did a, similarly to the War of Rehiram, a prequel series before, like, Robert's Rebellion, but instead of doing live action, they did animated, I'm all for it. But then again, 
I am a big animated film fan. Back to this 1978 adaptation of Lord of the Rings. I am old enough to remember a time before Peter Jackson's trilogy when this was the only thing Lord of the Rings related that we really had. And at one point as a kid, I just assumed that this was all we were going to get because we're going to talk about this in the production history, but there had been at least some very half-hearted attempts at adapting it into a live action film or films, you know, prior to Peter Jackson's trilogy. None of it really went anywhere. And it, it was just, I mean, both of you know the story of this. It was just deemed unfilmable. And it, mm -hmm. it was just assumed that it would just never happen. And that's why Jackson's trilogy really is such a, a, a masterpiece. And it's easy to forget this now, but this animated half version that we got in 1978, it does have a cult following. It does have its fans. Ralph Bakshi, he was a big name in the world of animation at one point. He was one of the very few Western filmmakers, I would say, who was experimented with mainstream animation specifically for adults. And, you know, animation, it just wasn't respected in 1978. Unless it was coming out of Disney, there wasn't really any animation that was for adults that really got any kind of a serious budget or was really taken seriously by a studio. A completely different world now, right? Like, there's a whole... I wouldn't even call it a subculture of, of animation that's just not for kids. There's a whole industry geared towards it. But Absolutely. 1978, it was it was very subcultural. It was very fringe. Yeah, there was really only one other film from 1978 that I can think of that had more mature themes, definitely not geared towards kids. And it was also uh, released in 1978, Watership Down. That is... Ugh. Oh, yeah. That yeah, was an example yeah. of a film where it was animated, geared towards adults. Didn't do well at the box office, but definitely more favorable than this lord of the rings film but like you said pat like very far like very few and far in between definitely yeah that's a good call out. i had forgotten about watership down i had seen that in years i have not seen this in years before i watched it the other day for for this episode i think the last time i watched this was like 1999 2000 so it's been a long long time this was quite a trip down nostalgia lane i didn't remember much from it you know it's been so long that honestly re-watching it the other day it was kind of like watching it for the first time oh it was just, was it uh, refreshing yeah right <laughs> uh no it was not. <laughs> we'll talk about that more. Uh, for now, you know, that's why we chose it for this week's episode. Um, Anton, let's get into the production history. Uh, as early as 1957, Ralph Bakshi, who was a very young animator at that point, and by the way, he is still alive at this point. He's, he is in his 80s. But he was trying to convince people that Tolkien's story, Lord of the Rings, could best be told through animation. By the end of the 1960s, the film rights to Lord of the Rings ended up in the hands of United Artists, who purchased it directly from J.R.R. Tolkien himself. United Artists were known for providing filmmakers with great, greater creative freedom than other studios, albeit with reduced budgets. Uh, Anton, this is the reason why James Bond originally mm -hmm. uh, was produced by United Artists in the early 1960s. Uh, they were realistically the only studio that would have backed something like this at the time. Film producer Dennis O'Dell was interested in making a film of the film version of this for the Beatles, the Beatles. Yes. The band, the Beatles. Yeah, the band. And uh, he, <laughs> he approached directors, David Lean, who was busy with Ryan's daughter and Stanley Kubrick, who deemed it unfilmable and Michelangelo Antonini, Antionone. Michelangelo Antonini, Kubrick taking a crack at this, that would have been fascinating, although it never would have happened. You know, knowing what we know about him, he would have insisted on making three films. He never would have finished it. John Borman, he was commissioned to write a screenplay, but the project was eventually dismissed as being too expensive to even attempt. That's right, Anton. John Borman, whose very next film after he wrote this screenplay would have been Exorcist II, The Heretic, one of the most horrific pieces of shit ever made. Yeah, I love those connections to past episodes. But yes, John Borman. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just for the listeners, that is still the worst film we have ever covered on this podcast. Hands down. And again, I just want to remind the listeners, up until 2001, when Fellowship of the Ring came out, like we all just assumed that a live-action version was never going to happen. Upon learning that Borman's script had been abandoned, Ralph Bakshi approached United Artists with his idea to do it as an animated film. So this is about 1974. 
When he learned that Borman's script included the entire story crammed into a single film, he said, quote, I thought that was madness, certainly a lack of character on Borman's part. Why would you want to tamper with anything Tolkien did, end quote. And he later claimed that Borman, quote, didn't understand the source material, end quote. The following year, after much lobbying on his part, Bakshi finally convinced United Artists studio head Mike Metavoy to finance Lord of the Rings as two or three animated films. The Borman script was offered, but Bakshi rejected it. Metavoy accepted Bakshi's proposal to do the books as close as we can using Tolkien's exact dialogue and scenes. Metavoy allowed Bakshi to shop his idea to other studios. The caveat was whoever agreed to make it would have to pay for the expenses of Borman's original script. Peter Bogdanovich was offered the chance to direct. Bakshi did manage to gain the support of Dan Melnick, then president of MGM. Bakshi and Melnick made a deal with Mike Metavoy at United Artists to buy the Borman script for $3 million. That's a lot of money for the 70s. And it's a lot of money now, but the 70s, geez. Yeah. Now, Borman was unhappy to learn that the adaptation was going to be animated. He never saw Bakshi's film, and after it was released, he tried to make his own live-action version with Metavoy as producer. But by the time Melnick was fired from MGM in late 1976, Bakshi's project had already cost the studio $600,000, and Melnick's successor had not read the books and had little interest in the project. So Bakshi then contacted Sal Zantz, who had helped him finance an earlier project and asked him to produce The Lord of the Rings. Zantz agreed. Once Zantz was on board, the project gained legitimacy. Now, Sal Zantz was a, a very well-respected producer, and he was coming off his greatest success. He had won the Best Picture Academy Award for co-producing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He would go on to win the award twice more for producing Amadeus and The English Patient. Here's some trivia for you both. Do either of you know who... Zance shared the best picture win for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with. Not a clue. Anton, any idea? Is is Anton there? All right, I re- realized I was on, uh, still on mute. I was I was saying, can you give us a hint? Ooh. He is a okay. <laughs> can I give you a hint? Did he date? Did he ever? Did, did he ever have a relationship with Glenn Close? Oh, you know the answer. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's just Michael Douglas. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There we yeah, go. Eric. So before Michael Douglas was really a serious actor, he was a producer. Okay. He won an Oscar for co-producing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Wow. Yeah. That Pretty cool. In, that is an interesting bit of trivia. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you know, son of Kirk Douglas, he originally got started in the industry by just being a producer. Oh, by the way, my hint for both of you was going to be an entire subgenre of thriller existed about a uh, suburban male who's horned up and nearly ruins his life several times <laughs> in several movies. So, um, fun fact: One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is one of my favorite movies of all time. So, oh, it's a phenomenal movie. Yeah. Back to the production history. Before production started, back she met with Tolkien's daughter Priscilla to discuss how the film would be made. She showed him the room where her father did his writing and drawing. And back, she says, quote, my promise to Tolkien's daughter was to be pure to the book. I wasn't going to say, hey, throw out Gollum and change these two characters. My job was to say, this is what that genius said. End quote. Musician Mick Jagger apparently wanted to play Frodo. We have no clue how that would have worked. And nowadays we could probably imagine him more in the role as Gollum. Keith Richards could work too. And can anyone, does anyone remember, of course, the famous film that did feature a, a, a famous Stones musician? The, the third pirate. Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah. Which we did discuss on the podcast. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so Bakshi began developing the script himself, working with Chris Conkling. He was unsure of how the three part film strong, structure would work and eventually settled on script for two 150 minute films the first of which was titled The Lord of the Rings, Part 1, The Fellowship. Zance and Bakshi were unsatisfied with the scripts and hired fantasy author Peter S. Beagle to do a rewrite. Beagle's changes included beginning the story with Bilbo's farewell party, climaxing with the Battle of Helm's Deep, and ending with the cliffhanger of Gollum leading Frodo and Sam to Shelob. The revised draft includes a brief prologue to reveal the history of the ring. Publicity for the film announced that Bakshi had created the first movie painting by utilizing an, quote, entirely new technique in filmmaking, end quote. Much of the film used live-action footage, which was then rotoscoped to produce an animated look. 
This saved production costs and gave the animated characters a more realistic look. Let's put a pin on that. We're going to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, bit. we're going to yeah, we're going to put a pin oh, in that oh, for oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> put an in arrow anima- in that. <laughs> yeah, in uh animation historian uh Jerry Brex, the animated movie guide Reviewer Maria Boylan writes that, quote, up to that point, animated films had not depicted extensive battle scenes with hundreds of characters. By using the rotoscope, back she could trace highly complex scenes from live action footage and transform them into animation, thereby taking advantage of the complexity live action film could capture without incurring the exorbitant cost of producing a live action film, end quote. Bakshi and Zant's relationship became very strained during production. And back she went to England to recruit a voice cast from the BBC drama repertory company that included Christopher Gard, William Squire, Michael Scholes, Anthony Daniels, and John Hurt. For the live action portion of the production, back she and his cast and crew went to Spain, where the rotoscope models acted out their parts in costume in the open or in empty sound stages, with additional photography taking place in Death Valley. And although he could use the same rotoscoping on future films, Bakshi later regretted his use of the technique, stating that he felt that it was a mistake to trace his source footage rather than using it as a guide. And by the time Bakshi and his team were done animating, he had only four weeks left to cut the film from its original 150-minute length. He asked for an additional three months to edit the film, but was denied by Zantz. And after test screenings, it was decided to recut the end of the picture so that Gollum would resolve leading Frodo and Sam to Shelob before cutting back to Helm's Deep so as to not end the film on a cliffhanger. Back, she wanted to include music by Led Zeppelin, but producer Saul Zantz insisted upon an orchestral score, so Leonard Rosenman was hired. Back, she later admitted that he hated Rosenman's work. One of the animators on this was none other than a young Tim Burton. This was the longest animation film ever made at the time of completion. According to Bakshi, when he completed the film, United Artists executives told him that they were planning to release the film without indicating that a sequel would follow, hence the misleading title. And Bakshi strongly opposed this. By the time the film's release, Bakshi was already working on the sequel, even going as far as filming some second unit footage. And Zantz went so far as to try to stop the Rankin and Bass's Return of the King TV special, which was already planned before Bakshi's film came out, and trying to stop it from airing so as to not clash with Bakshi's sequel, and the lawsuit followed. Bakshi found the entire experience extremely stressful and got into a heated argument with Zantz before refusing to do part two. Reports vary as to whether the argument had to do with the dropping of the part one subtitle or Bakshi's fee for the sequel. Zantz later admitted that making the film was the worst experience of his life and he became very protective of the property. The reaction from Tolkien fans was quite hostile in 1978 and to this day the film holds a 49% Rotten Tomato score. Here we are, gentlemen, to The Lord of the Rings from 1978. Wait, this is a, this is a 49% on Rotten Tomatoes? Yes. That's such generous shit. Yeah, gen- a little oh. generous. <laughs> That's being polite, generous. <laughs> uh, so you you don't think much of this, Eric? Listen, man, I tried, and and it's hard, right? Because you have to you have to look at this from the lens of the fact that we have the trilogy we have, and I, I and yeah. that it was you know 1978 you know trying to do the best that you can with whatever um without whatever money that you have i get all that and i was really trying to be like well you know maybe this was going on and 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 i'm trying to remove you know the peter jackson trilogy from my head because that wasn't around that and it's not a fair comparison um even with all that this thing is irredeemable it didn't need to be as long as it was. No, nothing made any sense. Well, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Please, please. Jeez. I need yeah, to. Right. It's, it's like, let's, this is like therapy for me. Right. Well, let, <laughs> us, meet at, let us meet at the, let us meet at the, uh, the great council of Elrond and speak. Why wasn't it better? Um, Pat, what, what is the first reason this film wasn't this, better? The storytelling. Eric, to your point, it is really not fair to compare this to Peter Jackson's trilogy. However, there were a lot of things working against this even when it came out in 1978. 
the decision not to attach part one to this in the mm-hmm. title was just a massive blunder on their part. The studio mm-hmm. reasoned that audiences wouldn't want to pay to see the first half of a movie, but it ended up backfiring on them because so just imagine there's no internet unless you read about this in a magazine or in the newspaper that it's really just going to be the first half of the trilogy. You have no idea when you're going to see this in the theater. You're right. That's that's messed up. And that was a huge backlash that that uh, fans of this felt about it then. It is kind of baffling that the sequel never happened. The film made more than enough money to justify it. You know, we, we cited, you know, it, has, it had a pretty low budget even for then. Four million dollars. It's less than twenty million dollars today. It, it made about what thirty-two million, Anton. Then, so that's about one hundred and fifty million today. So the profit was there for the studio. It just goes to show how little thought was given to animation back then. It, it, it wasn't a Disney movie. The studio treated it as probably an afterthought. And there's a lot of stuff you can read online about you know how the studio screwed Bakshi over by not making the sequel and how he really uh, the, the the defenders of this film will tell you that Bakshi should have gotten the opportunity to make the sequel to this and I think that's fair but my counter to that would be did the United Artists studio executives rightly rightfully identify this as garbage and just decided to quit where they were ahead what what would a sequel have done what would a sequel have done to make this particular piece of work any better nothing i don't think anything yeah i I don't understand how that is a defense that makes no sense oh well you know the sequel the sequel was going to be better than the first movie obviously said no one ever like you know what i mean there are people that like this movie there are really there really is i i I know because when doing research uh for the film uh, it was coming up. There were there were some articles coming up. The masterpiece that is the Lord of the Rings from 1978. So there are people out there that think this film is a masterpiece and innovative. That's, a, for that's, that's absurd. Are you sure it wasn't like the Onion? Right. It wasn't. It wasn't an ironic article. Okay. Uh, so, oh. yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the problem with it is that it's just way too much story for even a two plus hour film, right? You think about, again, I mean, I don't I don't want this this episode to just turn into an entire Peter Jackson trilogy comparison, but for right. for the purposes of this conversation, I'll I'll cite like even Fellowship of the Ring, right? It's three hours long and it leaves out a bunch of stuff from the book. Exactly. Right. And it's still three hours long. It still tells a pretty complete story. But so this is this is pretty much the entirety of Fellowship of the Ring, sort of, and then about 50% of what happens in the Two Towers, sort of. And they really do breeze through it. A lot of scenes just feel rushed. It's like watching an animated Cliff Notes version of the story. They're, and this is the this is my primary problem with the storytelling. They're really banking on the audience being very familiar with the source material. If you hadn't read the book going into this film, the first hour is going to be pretty confusing. The second hour, I doubt you'd even make it through it. It's very hard to tell what's going on if you're not super familiar with the story and the characters. And then from watching the film and trying and, and, and following along, then, of course, there's the exposition narrator that is just it always is a very a big pet peeve of mine when a film decides that they have to really have exposition just thrown at the audience like that. And even then they do it to really pace together these scenes and make it make a bit more sense, but it's just very lazy storytelling. But and- I, I, I'm not just real quick about what you said, Pat. I mean, yeah, it's, it's going to be a difficult storytelling process, but I think conservatively, especially when we start talking about the story, you could cut about half hour out of this film and it would still make perfect sense. There's a lot of scenes that just rag on for no reason. You're right. It's a mess. It really is. I think the the difference between, again, the Peter Jackson comparison, I have showed the Fellowship of the Ring and the uh, the two sequels to to people who have never read the books, right? And they're mm-hmm. able to follow it completely clearly. Right. This would be really tough to show to someone who had no knowledge of Lord of the Rings. Impossible. It, the first 20 minutes, they almost play out like a horror movie after you get through the prologue, which is like filmed. It's the rotoscoping stuff. And it, it's sort of uh, the prologue's filmed in. It, it looks like in front of like a burlap sack. Yeah, it was. And it was so bad. It like I, I, once it started, I was like, <laughs> oh, 
oh, this is what I'm in for. Okay. Like, it's a lot of... Ex- like, if you're going to do exposition, why does everything look like it's in, I don't know, a, a, a school production of what hell would look like? Why Why is it all red? <laughs> Lord Sauron forged a master ring after learning the, the secret oh from the elves God. of just it ring making. Felt in like year 34, in... 34, the second age, and then I saw an angel on a hill. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a golden trumpet. It was, it Even was, when it gets was... past the prologue, though, it, you, you get to Bilbo's birthday party. You're like, okay, that's, you know, they rush that. And then Gandalf is talking mm-hmm. to Frodo in this really dark, like, horror movie language. He, he's pointing at him dramatically. Gandalf is straight up unhit. His eyes are huge all the time, and is like, uh, uh, they're it's a they're jerk. Play- he's a jerk, and they're playing him as crazy too. Which I don't, I don't get that kind of vibe from Gandalf. Like he, he no. flies off the handle. You know? No, oh, he, he's I- even in the book in the source material. He's written as a as a very. Um, gregarious you know warm friendly character even though yeah. there are people that are very intimate like the hobbits like if you remember um all of the hobbits except for bilbo and frodo they're very intimidated by gandalf not just because of how tall he is just because of how he's a wizard he's not from here right he does all this crazy stuff or he's rumored to do it he's portrayed in here as un- unhinged is the right word eric Mm-hmm. It's, it it's a very get, strange char- characterization of him. And even after he, you know, not <laughs> spoilers, even after he becomes Gandalf the White, like he's still unhinged. <laughs> he's still yeah. absolutely insane. Yeah. I mean, the animation throughout the entire film, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but even in the Shire, it's it's pretty dark, like dark colored. I yeah. found it like it, it reminded me of like a horror movie. It's like genuinely creepy in some scenes, which I w- I almost want to praise the animation for, but I I don't think that's what they were going for, so I don't think I can praise them. I agree. What's making it seem creepy is the animation, <laughs> not yeah. You know, I think the stuff in Bree is effective with the Black Riders, like that. I think that was the only effective part of really the first half. Oh, There's some real just strange things happening. Before they get to Rivendell, like the flight to the Ford, they're walking at a pretty leisurely pace after Weathertop, even when they get attacked. They're walking mm. at a very leisurely pace until the Black Riders start chasing them. Aragorn just decides to charge at one of the riders on horseback. He gets hit by a horse for being a dumbass. Legolas does nothing except tell Frodo to run, like maybe help him out. All of them just watch Frodo ride off by himself. With they, n- none of them attempt to intervene or help him in any way. Oh, it's, my- it's just weird storytelling. Pat, that was the scene that broke me. That was the scene where I was like, "There's, there's, there, it's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any better." Oh, just- and like he just runs at the horse. What was he trying to do? He just runs at the horse, hits the side of the horse, and falls down. And then that whole scene afterwards with the horses, and they're just like, oh, the horses are, they're just sitting there and they're staring at each other. And like, I I sent Pat, like, I I was just kind of like taking notes just so I could, you know, try and figure out how I felt about it. But like, there's a line where it says, run, you fool, run, after Frodo has been standing there with the horse for about five minutes. He's already or, been stabbed at that point. At that, yes. and he, but he's just sitting there. And yeah. the rioters are just sitting there. And I'm like, what are we doing? Did I, did I break? Like, I thought I had, like, hit the rewind button because I watched it on YouTube. I thought I had hit the side of the screen because I was like, why is this going on for so long? And that's really when I was like, there isn't anything here. It was, it was, biz- <laughs> I think this was a, a symptom that we saw throughout the film, bizarre pacing. There would be a scene where nothing yeah. is happening yeah. and then suddenly there's some sort of action or awkward cuts to whatever they decided to animate for that scene. And you're just getting that all over the film. And it just felt really- very awkward really poor sense of scale you never really get a sense of how far they're traveling or the distance Mm -hmm. between two points where they're going like again the flight to the ford 
I think is the weakest part of the film for me. Oh, you absolutely. have no idea what direction they're traveling in. There's a bunch of stuff that happens that's unexplained. Like one of the black riders, he seems to slow down Frodo's horse with, with some kind of magic. Like if you remember, the horse falls right. over at one point and then Frodo gets back on it and, and keeps riding away. And then the animation gets real psychedelic when the riders are coming at him. Again, really no explanation for it. I think they were trying to imply that the the ring was having some kind of an effect on Frodo, but I, I, again, I wasn't sure. But like it, it, and it all stems from like the the Black Riders, like right the Ring Wraiths. Why are they limping? And like, can they see them or not? Because at the whole Weathertop sequence, I was so confused as to what was going on, because they were like translucent, the, right? Was... And they're and everyone's standing around in a circle, not doing anything. And then nobody reacts until Frodo puts on the ring. And I'm like, what are, can they see the wraiths? Are the wraiths invisible? Is, is this supposed to be the bleeding in between worlds? Like where, where Frodo goes. But in that case, can the wraiths do anything until Frodo puts the ring on? These are the things. It's just so confused. The whole, all these sequences are confusing or drawn out or, bizarrely paced and you can't really put them together in a way that well you could put them together in a way that makes sense i guess if you read the books right and that. that's 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 the point i'm trying to make unless you read the books you would be like what in the hell is going on i think you can really explain this by the budget and the schedule they when there was inconsistencies in either the plot or the pacing a they didn't have the money to fix it b they didn't have the time to mm -hmm. correct it so they just kind of had what they had, and this is the end result. Yeah, and to be fair, there is like a difficulty with animated films compared to live action films, right? Like live action, you just take you you have multiple takes. Animated films, you really have to make sure there's a very strong vision for what you want the animators to put together. What does the next scene look like? How do we think about scaling this world as it works with the beat of the story? And if that's not all aligned or if things change, it's very difficult to then come in and really adjust that. And I feel like probably that we saw symptoms of that. Agreed. I, I have some questions about the characters, just observations that I was making. Why is Saruman... Carrying around a tree trunk as uh, a staff. I'm sorry, you said Saruman. Don't you mean Aruman? Aruman. Aruman Gandalf. <laughs> or Aruman of many colors. <laughs> Yo, that whole sequence in that that was another one where I didn't know what was going on. It gets though, real psychedelic without an explanation. Right, but are they in weird. a different world? Are they still inside? He must be outside because the eagle picks him up, but there's still the lights around. Like and and what a terrible wizard battle. It's just like... It wasn't so even the, a battle. It, the lights change a little bit. Ugh. I'm telling you, man, this this one this one broke me. Th that was <laughs> a that was a weird stylization for that scene. Man, I really hate to go back to the Peter Jackson films, but you have to. You, you have to. It, it just made it just makes more sense. If right? you can't directly reference the books. The Peter Jackson films really are the next best thing. So I think it's fair to go back to them. Um, suffice to say, why was he carrying around a tree trunk? <laughs> it really is a tree trunk. Like I, I went yeah. back and rewound. I was like, that's a funny looking staff. It looks more like a tree. It was, I, I don't know. Well, I, I don't uh, remember from the books, like Saruman's uh, staff being described as that of like a tree trunk but he was very like he he was uh, described yeah, as having I, very close connection to like nature right he did at one point and then he lost it which of course right. treebeard points out in the book yeah i don't think he had a tree trunk as a staff i don't think tolkien would have written anything that stupid uh, why is elrond dressed like a roman senator the uh, same reason why boromir is dressed as a viking and the same reason why Aragorn and multiple other men are wearing that very, very short garb. Without any sleeves? No, the, the well, I mean, I... No, he didn't have, yeah, he didn't have sleeves or pants. Yeah, I called them miniskirts, too, and it's like... They were like, high up there. It reminds me of, like, a really cheap cut-rate action figure that you'd get at, like, five below. 
Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They do look like uh, He-Man toys. That's it. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah. And he, he looks like a Native American, which has been much maligned on the internet. It's pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, he's supposed to be this this rugged character, and I mean, like, I I, I don't if that was some based on some kind of real armor or something like that, then cool. But I don't know. It just looks so weird. I mean, he looks stupid, but my problem with Aragorn in the film, he's he's mostly useless. He doesn't do a whole lot. I don't know if you you brought this up, but in one scene, the actor, as they're rotoscoping, he literally falls down, yeah. and they keep yeah. the take. They kept it in there. Yeah. So, Is this during Helm's Deep? Uh, uh, wait, hold on. I have it in my notes. I have it noted, so we'll figure out when it is. It's after Lothlorien. I think it's after Boromir dies, and they're like running. After oh, oh okay Pippen. yeah i know what you're talking about yeah, yeah he just he just eats it and they left it in <laughs> the the orcs if you remember during uh amon hen where pippin and mary get taken and boromir gets killed mm. um the orcs who are really uh the Urukai, um they just randomly appear out of nowhere mary and pippin literally bump into them there there's no context that they were pursuing the fellowship or that they're working for saruman I it, it's almost like there was some thing they cut out that showed them previously. They they just literally bump into them. I Filmmakers think are there lucky was, that we knew more. Yeah, I think there was some mention that the that the Urkai or well, some like Sauron or Mordor's forces were chasing them. But you're right; they're just sort of like in the in the forest. They're and, also they're just like hanging around. They're not really going anywhere. Merry and Pippin. Yeah. It's like they're camping out. Mary and Pippin just stumble into them. Right. I don't know. The orcs in this film reminded me of the Tusken Raiders from Star Wars and not in a good way. Mm-hmm. In some shots, I was really reminded of the Gamorians from Star Wars, the, the pig-like creatures. The Gamorians. Oh, one oh, of, the guards at uh, Jabba's palace? Yeah, one of them got eaten by uh, the Rancor. <laughs> oh, that's right. Good call. Gotcha. That's a good one. Yeah. Don't look like orcs or whatever yeah, orcs look, look like. You know what orcs look like? The ones in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. That's what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what orcs look like. Shouts out, PJ. Love you, man. Yeah. yeah. Like, they don't look like the ones in The Hobbit. I can tell you that. <laughs> no. Um, Eric, would I mean, you like to be on at least one of The Hobbit films when we cover those? Absolutely. Yeah. Don't hate them as much as I hate them. <laughs> that's even... fair they're they're they're, they're oh definitely God. not on this level yeah yeah did you notice um even in the rotoscope scenes like when the rohirrim are hunting the company of orokai there's a lot of camera shake going on i i don't know that it was deliberate uh, it was yeah. and and that was really jarring and not only was there like a lot of camera shake but then individual like characters in the scenes would also have slight jitters to their movements mm-hmm and it was just very it really takes you out of the experience watching the film and that was any scene that had the rotoscoping yeah yeah and it's that weird day for night gray color grading there's just entire shots where everything is just colored gray it's it's idiotic and i've seen like there's there's a um indie game that's called uh, it's called the faith trilogy it was made by one guy um, it uses like Atari graphics, but it's very scary. And the way he used rotoscoping uh, to make some of the scenes and it's pixelated, but it looks better than this a lot of the time. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it can be very effective. There's no doubt. Uh, but like and and we, we sort of said it before, but there was no sense of depth. I didn't understand sort of like, well, I understood, but you know, when uh, one of the Rohirrim like runs at the orcs and it appears like he just ran directly into them and, and just died. It looks and, like they're in the same room. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. just don't know what's going on. As far as some of the characters, right? Some of the supporting characters, Theoden. King Theoden of Rohan, right? At least in the Peter Jackson version, they explain him as being under the spell of Saruman. Here, he's just a moron. He comes across as this like poor, benevolent Santa Claus. Like yeah. the second Wormtongue leaves, he asks Gandalf, like, please tell me what to do. Like, is he an invalid? Like, can he not make his own decision? He's the kingdom. He's a king of this entire kingdom. He's like, I, what should I do? Where should I go? Yeah, delivery uh. just so lame and also not great voice acting in that scene either well 
hold, but hold on because worm tongue was hilarious oh yeah <laughs> stroking the king's beard Ugh. i was i was having a laugh that i've was... always tried to give you good advice my king saruman is our friend Oh, Eowyn looks exactly like Galadriel. Like, did they copy and paste the same character animation? Was it like a palette swap? Sure right. looks like it. She looks so much like her that I had to pause the film to, like, come to my senses. I'm like, wait a minute. Is that Galadriel in Theoden's posse? Like, what's going on here? I, I mean, there's know. there's a few things you can look at from the film. A and, few. And, yeah, just and, a few. And, and, well, and, and know that uh, good old Peter Jackson was like, you know, let's build off of that. Yeah, I mean... The Helm's Deep part, I mean, that's the centerpiece of the two towers, right? But that's, mm -hmm. I, it's not handled well here. I mean, there's, there's, mm -hmm. uh, the, the sound design in Helm's Deep is worthy of its own YouTube video. It's atrocious. It's, there's <laughs> really no other way to put it. And mm -hmm. I think about one, when we think about the production notes and there was a decision to use the rotoscoping to more, accurately capture like a large battle scene for an animated film and it just the execution was just so poor do we want to give this any credit for the fact that peter jackson acknowledged and took inspiration from some things in this you see i was just about to ask that because I, as i was watching it there's a couple times in my notes that i'm like was this used as some sort of influence to assist in the new trilogy there definitely was, and Jackson has acknowledged that himself. There's a handful of shots that he tried to mimic in his own version of this. So here's my thing. Without this existing, the, tr the new trilogies would have been just as good. I'm just going to go out there and say it. So no. That's, that's I, fair. I that's very fair. I don't think we can give it a lot of credit because really we can't give this so much credit because it in and of itself is still basing itself on the source material. So if this was gone, Peter Jackson would still have the source material. So I don't even think that's that redeems it at all. Personally, that's just my personal opinion. No, I think that's yeah. fair. That's a good point. I'm I mean, from my end, I think there's a lot of the stylization of the characters, the costuming that just doesn't work. But at the same time, even the way that the hobbits are dressed, you just kind of take it for granted. Oh, yeah, that's just how hobbits are dressed. But that's basically exactly how they look in Peter Jackson's film. And with that, a lot of the background scenes, a lot of the detail, different buildings. I actually that was something that I particularly liked in the film. But for the most part, I totally agree with you, Eric. There's a lot of the film that I don't know if it was a much of a much to really add value if it was a jumping off point for the Peter Jackson trilogy. That's a good point, Anton. I do feel like conceptually they got some of the world building right. I think at times they captured the quote unquote feel of Tolkien's story conceptually. I think it's the execution where they fell flat. And there's always going to be folks that look at different animated films and say, eh, the look and feel is not for me. But I think in this particular film, that was all over the place. There wasn't really a particular set style. And part of that is because of the rotoscoping. I think part of it is maybe they didn't really have a very strong vision for what some of these characters should look like. I mean, even take a look at just the four main hobbits from The Fellowship. You had Merry, Pippin, and Frodo that look pretty normal, and then you have whatever happened to Samwise. Oh, we'll talk about Sam. Yeah, I mean, Peter Jackson, he said a lot about this film over the years. He described the, the film as, quote, disjointed in the second half, end quote. I have to agree with that. I think he's being polite. I agree. I was just going to say he's being polite. <laughs> yeah. I know it's an animated film, but the acting is really wooden. The voice acting in particular, the, the rotoscoping doesn't help, but there's some really bad ADR. A lot of the voices sound very flat, like they all did one take. A lot of them sound similar. It's really bland. A lot of characters are speaking in the same monotone. And look, I understand it. like voice performances in animation back then, they, they just weren't taken as seriously as they are now. This was before the era where famous actors lent their voices to animation. I'm not saying that an animated film has to have famous actors to lend their voices, although there were some well-known names in this, you know, John Hurt probably being the only real one, Anthony Daniels if you're a Star Wars fan. But to me, all of almost all of the dialogue feels really, really stilted and doesn't really fit together. There's a lot of 
awkward long pauses between characters speaking to each other, even in the same scenes, the conversations really feel unnatural a lot of the time. Yeah, and I'm wondering if a lot of it has to do with, like you said, the ADR. I wonder, I know for one scene where uh, Mary and Pippin just show up, there's very obvious ADR after that that sort of tries to explain why they showed up. So I'm wondering how much of the woodenness is because these actors were like called back in to do... And and you're right, maybe they laid it down in just one take because they were like, ain't got time for this. You know what I mean? It's possible. I think the budget really hurt them. They just, the, the one take thing really seems to be the reason. Who knows? But also with the writing, this suffers from the George Lucas paradox. It gets caught in that halfway house where they, it seems like they really couldn't decide if they wanted this to be for adults or kids. There's some really serious moments of drama in here. And then you get some just horrifically stupid cornball stuff. They really mm -hmm. should have just picked a lane and went with it. But again, that was the time in 1978. It was impossible for a studio to commit any type of a budget to a film without it. Like, well, it's animated. We have to appeal to kids. And it's just so funny that for them, that's what makes it appealing to kids. Let's throw in some horrible dialogue or stupid jokes. Well, there's no character development. No one has any kind of an arc whatsoever. Sam... Oh, Samwise. Oh, jeez. <laughs> he is portrayed God. as a complete simpleton, borderline special needs. I'm not even trying to like make a joke here. I don't understand the characterization of him. It's because, not fair to him at all. It had because, to be deliberate on their part. They portray him as a complete moron. And we all know that the real hero of The Lord of the Rings is Sam. Right. So, like... Uh, you're you're right. It's it's absolutely devastating to the original character of Sam. And like, yeah, I mean, Frodo and Sam both kind of, I th from what I remember of the books, they both kind of get a little uh, bitchy at times. You know what I mean? Like, kind of complaining about stuff, um, which I would too. Don't get me wrong. If I had to walk to a a, a, a volcano, I wouldn't be very happy either but it really did him a disservice and because then you're left with frodo right and frodo wasn't really i wasn't really rooting for him either in this movie no so who are do they, i root are, for are, are they a couple in this film there they was a lot of intimacy really scenes. yeah they really seem to imply it a couple times but they never really elaborate on it um i didn't get that vibe but i i also wasn't paying that much attention <laughs> so so i know uh, there, there's a lot of scenes where sam and frodo are having some very intimate conversations very face to face very close and i know what you mean pat it was definitely like what what are these undertones that we're seeing um, they don't go anywhere with it they though. don't yeah they don't they don't go anywhere but confusing in the same way, we, no way. We, we, no. we have no, we have no idea where they were going with that. In the same way that I don't know why they decided to make Sam Wise's two front teeth have an argument. Oh, Mister Frodo! Oh. Because again, they were trying to portray him as a dope and like the dopey this, sidekick, yeah. like the like the, the village I apologize, idiot. I apologize for this reference, but like the mater to the Lightning McQueen, like in Cars, like an idiot with like a, a a more successful friend. But that's not who Sam is. No, so like no. the idiot with a heart of gold. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also the sidekick to the main, uh, right. much smarter in air quotes protagonist. Boromir yeah. looks a lot like Gimli. Yeah, he does. I asked you, I was like, well, I don't know how he's described. I don't remember how he's described in the books. And you told me like, that's absolutely not the case, right? He didn't look like a Viking in the books. He was not described that way. To my knowledge, he was not described that way in the books. I haven't read the books in a while. but Gotcha. And then here's yeah. the funny one. Saruman, who Anton, you pointed this out. His name was changed to Aruman to avoid confusion with Sauron, which no Tolkien fan would ever confuse. They treat him like some kind of bizarre Howard Hughes type hermit. <laughs> Again, complete mischaracterization of who he was in the books. He is antagonistic from the very second you meet him. At no point do you buy that he's Gandalf's friend. But they also screwed up the Saruman Aruman name several times. He's referred to as both. They didn't even get that right. They didn't complete that, the final cut. He also has a weird voice, like Saruman of many colors. It's just so strange. Gollum looks like Mac from Mac and Me. Creepy. 
Yeah, you, you, you yeah, that is an apt comparison. A little bit pressure. His which voice again, is, which again, it's not, I don't know. I understand you have to remove the new trilogy, Smeagol Gollum, because that guy nailed it. I forget his name. The guy Andy Circus. Yeah. Andy Circus. Absolutely Andy. nailed Legend. it. And it's a hard performance to place something that came out previously against. So I, I will say that. And I do think that the voice actor tried. But yeah, yeah, it still still sucks. Did you either of you guys ever watch Gargoyles, the animated series from the 90s? Only on cable and uh, occasionally. No. But I remember it. Yeah. There there was one of the Gargoyles, Lexington, the smallest one. That's who I was reminded of when gotcha. I when I when I saw Gollum. I was like, whoa, whoa, I've seen you before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, voice wasn't bad. He kind of had the like oh smiggle this. But they it the film didn't do a good job of portraying how dangerous he is. Yeah. When when Frodo and Sam like quote unquote capture him, they're just like, "We won't let you go again." And he's just like, "Oh, okay, Sneagol will lead you away." It's it's very lame. Yeah, and all the all the like deals that were made, Frodo's just like, "Oh, you 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 swear you're not, they they tie him up, and then Frodo's like, "You swear you're not going to hurt us?" He's like, "Yep," and then they untie him. <laughs> they're like, "All right, peace." All right, cool. And it's like, <laughs> oh, the precious. I mu- I must say the precious. The second film from the Peter Jackson trilogy really is dedicated to that tumultuous relationship between them. True. And and there isn't enough time in this movie to even come close to developing that. That brings us to the next reason why this wasn't better, which we've been dunking on this throughout our commentary so far. But it, it is the production of this film. It, it made me appreciate Peter Jackson's versions even more. This was, to be fair to them... One of, if not the most challenging source material to adapt. I would say either this or Dune would be the most challenging. Mm -hmm. This is just a gigantic swing and a miss. It looks rushed. You can tell they had a limited budget. You can tell they were trying to be creative, but the the overall production quality, we've been hinting at it left and right here, but the, the rotoscoping stuff, it really is from another time. It was mainly used to save money. It's cheaper than animating from scratch. Now, with modern computers, it's just not something you really see anymore for good reason. It simply just doesn't look as good as traditional animation. You know, compare this to Disney films that were contemporaries of this in the 70s, and it it just doesn't hold up. The last movie I can really remember seeing full rotoscoping in was uh, Richard uh, Richard Linklater's uh, A Scanner Darkly, Mm. which I thought was very, it was used very effectively there. Yeah, Yeah, that's a cool looking movie. Yeah, film uh, listeners may remember uh, Scanner Darkly with a friend of the show, Keanu Reeves. And uh, Robert Downey. And Robert Downey. And he's he's in that, right? Yeah. Yes, he is. That's a pretty cool movie. Mm-hmm. But the rotoscoping here, the quality of it varies. It's feast or famine. There's some shots where I actually think it is quite effective. I think in some of the Moria shots, mm-hmm. it it looks okay. It's effective with the orcs, I think, in some scenes. But in others, it looks completely lifeless and crude and messy, very amateurish. Yeah, and I mean, you look at, you look at some scenes like in Brie where... <laughs> The Ugh. townspeople all look. It looks like if like Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a mm-hmm. horror movie. Like there's there's some people that looks like cartoons, and then some people that look like they're just cell shaded. Yeah, that's super jarring because up until that point, everybody has had the same cartoon effect over them, and then you know then there's these creepy townspeople that all look no, no, like you're, real you're, people. You're right about Brie because that's probably the worst example of it. The human characters, they're fully rotoscoped it looked like so everything that they're doing is like fully realistic the faces and everything. Mm-hmm. It completely clashes with the traditionally animated hobbits. They just don't go together at all. I want to also just observe that rotoscoping as a technique. There are instances, right, of films where it does look good or, um, you know, Pat, like you said, it's been used in the contemporaries um, by Disney. I mean, Mary Poppins is a really good example of rotoscope technique that has aged, you know, pretty well. Um, over the years who can forget of course rotoscoping was used in in star wars and particularly in a new hope during the lightsaber battle between obi-wan and darth vader so it is a technique that if you're a little too heavy-handed uh we have the example in lord of the rings where 
it just looks very out there and especially for the technology of the time and the usage just not great execution they were relying on it to basically carry entire sequences of the film and eric you your point about the cell shading that really hits home it just looks very unnatural in a lot of scenes i mean it looks kind of cool on the uh the ring wraiths and it looks kind of cool on the uh orcs and stuff yeah yeah but but by uh, that one scene that it's just like it's too much of the uncanny valley there and then you have just these cartoonish hobbits you know it just doesn't mesh together at all Mm -mm, nope and you can really tell in the second half when they were running out of money there's a number of shots during and after helm's deep where one character is moving or talking and all the others are frozen like they're in a still painting very distracting very very funny when they get to rivendell and like uh frodo sees bilbo and he goes bilbo and then all the music and all the background stuff just stops like everyone's stuff they're like all the chatter stops all the music stops and it's like for me it was like a record scratch moment and i was like why don't people know bilbo's here i i thought that they were like oh bilbo's been hiding here it's but stuff like that just like you know you're absolutely correct some of the audio choices were strange oh well, we mentioned it before but the the adr is just generally terrible the one thing i have in my notes here when they're walking in the woods just before fleeing to rivendell aragorn and legolas are having a conversation and it's full of echoes it's like they're they're talking to each other up close but it sounded like they recorded the dialogue in like an empty warehouse right it just doesn't fit at all and again it's it's the uncanny valley thing it's the um the non-visual version of the uncanny valley like audio only right your brain can tell when the audio sounds completely unnatural yeah and something i wanted to to touch on pat you and i chatted about this before the recording it's fair to assume that the production the execution of the animation the awkwardness of the voiceovers this is probably a product of the fact that this was under the united artists studio is that fair to say yeah because like the point i'm trying to make is there are a lot of contemporaries even you know across the seas that were able to execute and create a much much superior product compared to what we have here and you know it's it's not fair to 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 mention or it's not fair to say but even looking at studio ghibli in 1979 they released um lupin the third's the castle of cogliostro now if you look at that film's budget, it was $2.3 million compared to the budget of this film. I challenge any listener, you know, Eric and Pat also, if you haven't seen that film, w- watch just the first five to ten minutes. And it's amazing to see what they did with that budget versus what the whole budget did for this particular film. Right. Anime in general, particularly in that era, you know, Japan always took animation seriously, especially for adults. Mm-hmm. You know, True. And- Hollywood just did not at this point, unless unless it was for Disney. But again, Disney was making right. animation for children. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I, I do wonder, I mean, the, the Disney budget behind what they would have wanted to execute, maybe they were lacking of just the needs and the funds to really execute on the vision. But yeah, it was a definitely poor product animation wise. I will give it some props for being creative in the animation department. But it loses a lot of points for me because at no point did I think any of the animation was beautiful. This is a thoroughly ugly film. Agreed. I I, I guess, you know, you could say they tried and failed, but I still can't say that that is any kind of redeemable thing. No, it's not. It's not. I've, I've, guys, I'm trying so hard here. <laughs> well, let's, 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 let's switch gears, Eric. You're a music guy. What did you think of the music? I hated it, Pat. It was um, horrible. It was, it, it's very, it's well, awful. It was, it's a, it all very, over the place. It's very indicative of the time. So you have that. It's, it's very um, orchestral, I, old school orchestral, Hollywood. But, but very tinny and very high pitched. And when you have that, I mean, it's hard now because, again, it's 1978. And obviously audio has come a long way but you're right it's just too much it's all over the place you need to have a successful movie soundtrack video game soundtrack anything like that you have to have like a few themes 
And then you carry those themes sort of throughout the movie. And really good themes can be used for both happy and sad. A real great example of this is the theme from Up. Uh, you know, in the beginning sequence, it's all the same notes, but it can mm -hmm. be happy and it can be sad. This Michael lacks... Giacchino. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, absolutely uh, brilliant and, and, and amazing. But even if it were not as somebody as skilled as a composer or a songwriter, if you just did those things, it would have been so much better. And that's why you say it, it feels all over the place. There isn't like, you know, bum, ba, ba, bum, ba, 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 and then some sort of variation of that, you know, bum, ba, ba, ba when they're like it's quiet you're you could also do uh an entire series on the music of the lord of the rings too but like that's what it needs and when it doesn't have that that's what makes it feel like it's all over the place you know what well I mean? this doesn't have it it doesn't have it no there was no i i can't and if if there was i can't remember it i think you're selling the era short there was a tremendous era for film scores back then you had john williams and jerry goldsmith doing their thing sure. my sure. point is there is no excuse for this this film score to be this poor so ralph actually hated it and rightfully it, so this this is all over the place what, it felt like an afterthought Right. What I was trying to say is maybe, you know, because they had less of a budget, if you don't have a budget to make the music sound good, it's not going to sound good. And it was even harder to do that back then than it is now. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. Well, I mean, it's 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 strange because Leonard Rosenman was a very accomplished film composer. You know, he, he had done some hope, high profile stuff. He would do one of the Star Trek films later on, oh. got an Oscar nomination for it. But this is just it. There's there's parts where it sounds like a Disney score, mm -hmm. and then it goes to old school Hollywood, and he's and then at some points he's going for this medieval sound with a pan flute. It's too extreme. He relies on that dramatic bum 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 like several times. Yeah, abuses that. It, you know what it sounded like to me? Which to your point about the budget probably makes sense. It sounded like a cheap TV film score from that era. For sure, not a movie. That's a fair assessment. And believe it or not, the score has a cult following too. The, the, the soundtrack has been reissued on CD like a few different times. I couldn't tell you why. And that's fine. I'm yeah. glad someone <laughs> can enjoy this. I wish I'm glad them well. someone likes that's, it. Yeah. That's I wish the them nicest well. thing I'm going to say about those individuals. I'm glad I mean, you can enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, comparing it to the Peter Jackson trilogy, Howard Shore's work on those films. Uh, top three film score of all time, probably, right? Yeah. Yeah. Film, yeah. Film score, for sure. I yeah, don't but... have anything else to say about this film in terms of why wasn't it better. I, I feel like we thoroughly beat this like a pinata. Well, Patrick, we haven't gotten to rating yet, so there is still... We haven't. You're right. We, there is still some beating to be done. Yes, Would you like is. to go first as, as we wrap this up? You know what? As the guest, I like to go last. Okay. Um, of course. I feel like I've always gone last and requested going last. That's fine. I, I don't know why. And it's not, again, I say this every time, it's not going to change my answer. Uh, so please, no, I, I'm really no, interested it. in your ratings and, and your final thoughts. Anton, I would yeah. like to go first if you don't mind. Please. I had not seen this in, like I said, over 20 years. I had decent memories of it as a kid. I recognized the flaws, you know, even at a young age. So I, it's not like I ever loved this, like a like a Disney movie or, you know, something else of, of that nature. I came to this rewatch for this episode at least prepared to somewhat defend its limited redeeming qualities, but I don't really think there's anything to defend. This is garbage. I don't know if there was any possibility of this being good under United Artists. As we talked about in the production history, they were never fully committed to making this an animated adaptation, and they seemed to do so only begrudgingly. They never took the project seriously, and it showed. The Rotten Tomatoes headline summarizes this as a, quote, flawed but inspired interpretation, end quote. I think that's extremely generous. It's too interesting to hate just based on the source material and how it actually got made. I can appreciate the attempt. I think if you're a serious Tolkien fan, you should at least entertain the possibility of watching it once. 
I do think Ralph Bakshi was ahead of his time for what he was trying to do with animation. And I think if you're studying animation, his name is almost certainly going to come up. But the execution of this is extremely sloppy. I understand there were some budget constraints, but when I say sloppy, I mean sloppy. The, the storytelling is an absolute mess, and the animation that they used was very ineffective for what they were trying to do. This is an F for me. This is a just a complete failure of a film. I can respect what they were trying to do, but I can only judge the end result, and the end result is a very poor film. Anton? When I think of The Lord of the Rings and my love for the franchise, it really does skew towards the Peter Jackson trilogy and then that tied to my enjoyment of the of the novels as a child. When I think of this film, when it came out in 1978 and the expectations, there was definitely high expectation to do something right with Lord of the Rings. And I think with that, it's so difficult to be able to adapt, like Pat said, a work like this with such high expectations or even Dune. So I think the film didn't have that going for it. So if, it, if, there, if, if there was anything that I would say for that the end product wasn't as great as it could have been, it was a very you know difficult, almost impossible task to be able to take the film, not only animate it, but then everything that happened, they tried to stick it all in one film or even a portion of it. That being said, I just am not a fan of this film. Ever so often, there will be films that elicit like bodily like reactions where I just feel myself just my, my body just wanting to go into the fetal position, wanting to just look away from the camera. And this is actually one of those films I just felt very uneasy. The rotoscoping is just very jarring. Some elements that I can have respect for are how this is a, you know, definitely is a jumping point. Um for Peter Jackson for how there was stylization in the in the Peter Jackson trilogy of Lord of the Rings but even then just looking at this film objectively like it's just not great story uh we we've gone on and on about the plot and just the execution of the animation the poor music the, there's we're we're going to continue to beat this horse but you know I'll take one more whack it it felt like I was on one of those um what do you call them where you have the they're not they're not escalators but they're on the ground usually at airports to help assist people to go further during long distances during like to go between gates a moving right. sidewalk yeah the yeah the moving sidewalk it felt like that but then it would be because it's just going through the film and then it would stop and you have a rotoscope or you'd have a rotoscope scene and then it goes through the moving sidewalk again and then you find yourself at the end of it and you're like well that was that was something yeah this film's enough for me fair enough well um i'm gonna come right out of the gate and disagree with pat do not watch this movie there is no point in watching this movie especially with the modern trilogy out right now i agree with anton that i was physically mentally emotionally disrupted by this movie and not it was <laughs> one of the worst movie going experiences that i have ever experienced and listen, it's one thing to make a bad movie. It's another thing to make a long, bad movie. And this was a long, bad movie. As an artist, sometimes you have to look at yourself and say, this is an impossible task, so I'm not going to do it. Impossible tasks are impossible because they're freaking impossible. If it wasn't able to be done back then, it shouldn't have been done. So here's what you do. You either watch the original trilogy or you read the book. There's no point in this. Don't do it. Go watch a supercut of the memes on YouTube and you will get a better experience than watching the entire thing. Me, I regret that I had even set eyes on this piece of crap. If, don't, if, even if it's free, even if it's free, you should be paid to watch this movie. Somebody should pay you. That is the only time that it's acceptable to watch this movie. This gets beyond an F. This gets in school <laughs> suspension. This is this is terrible. Don't do it. Don't do it. You may turn to drugs. Don't do it. 
That's it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, oh you, didn't, you, completely, didn't... You, you completely changed my mind. I can't <laughs> recommend this. Don't can't... don't watch this. Don't watch hey, Eric, this film. Eric, don't keep uh, us in suspense. You didn't give us a letter grade. <laughs> oh, I've been waiting for that. Oh my god. <laughs> Uh, Eric's right. I take back what I said. I can't <laughs> recommend this to anyone. Just avoid this. It's this is terrible. It's garbage. Yeah, I would completely listen, agree. I would still give it an F in 1978. I would still say don't go watch this movie. So uh, there's no point. Wow. Well, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. definitely that, goes was down. Was that the harshest uh, critique y'all have had on the show? We've felt some sort of way about Exorcist too, but this definitely gives it a run for its money. That's yeah. Fair. I still think Exorcist 2 is a worse film than this, but this is I, this is pretty bad. I can totally agree with you on that, man. You've yeah. seen Exorcist 2? Yeah, 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 unfortunately. Yeah. I won't do it again. I'm glad you already covered it because I'm not I'm not doing it again. <laughs> nope. This movie is worse than sci-fi original movies. It, mm, it wasn't yeah, even it, it's, it wasn't yeah. even comical in a in a so bad it's good way. No. You're right. It was ugly. No. Which ugh, just don't listeners, please. And listen, for the people who like this movie, I'm glad you like it. If you haven't seen it, just don't. Please don't. No, you're right. It, when you have the Peter Jackson trilogy, like this is a pretty colossal waste of time. But um, if it was an there's hour no, and a half, there's no need. To, there's no need it, to talk about if this it anymore. If it was an hour and a half, hour fifteen, maybe two and a half yeah. hours, no way. Yeah. No. Yeah, it was ugh, gross. Well, that's it for uh, 1978, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Nothing else to add there. Um, Eric, it has been an absolute pleasure. I was really looking forward to you hating on this film, and I completely <laughs> underestimated just how much you hated it. <laughs> I figured you did. Because, <laughs> again, I usually i am like, you know what? There's some rede- No, there's no redemption here. No, no, there isn't. And, <sighs> and Eric, love having you on. So great having you back. <laughs> it's always yeah. a pleasure, guys. And thanks for, you know, thanks for supporting my stuff, too. And, uh, of course. You know? Of course. Um, I'm always happy to be on another episode. And congrats on 50 episodes. That's huge. That's awesome. Proud of you, Thank boys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We will have you back, I believe, sometime next season. I won't reveal what the film is, Anton, mm. but Eric and I have already agreed mm. to what that what that film mm. will be. Yeah, it's a good one. It's juicy. It's actually going to be, I'll give you listeners a hint. Eric will be back for the 40th anniversary of a film that we are going to celebrate. Nice. I'll, I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it there. Uh, mm-hmm. Next week, listeners can expect something that was not originally on our season three schedule. As I mentioned in the very beginning of this episode, this is a listener request that we will be covering. It is a film from 2023, and I will leave it there. That is it for this week's edition of Why Wasn't It Better? See you next time. Mm-hmm.